want to welcome uh, Dr. Catherine Smith from the Neuropsychiatric uh, Research Institute in Fargo, uh, North Dakota. Uh, Dr. Smith uh, received her PhD in clinical psychology from Kent State University, uh, has completed um, an internship and uh, two, well, two, po and two postdocs uh, in eating disorders, one more clinically focused and one very research focused. Uh, she has published extensively in the area of eating disorders, uh, looking at a wide variety of issues, some nosological issues in eating disorders, like an eating disorder uh, as a potential uh, different way of conceptualizing uh, eating disorders, as well as looking at um, uh, affective and emotion regulation and its role in uh, eating disorders in particular. And I don't want to take too much to jump into her talk today. Um, so let's give her a warm coyote welcome. And introduce her. Eating disorders are also one of the most diverse uh, 
psychiatric disorders. Um, so mortality rates are twice as high as what we see in the general population. Um, and that's actually six times as high when we just look at anorexia. So one in five of those deaths um, can be attributable to suicide. Um, with respect to treatments, unfortunately, our outcomes remain less than optimal. Um, so only about one in five individuals who sort of seek treatment. Um, and those who do don't fare particularly well. So uh, less than half of individuals with anorexia or bulimia uh, will make a full recovery. Uh, we also know that eating disorder behaviors uh, are not uncommon in the general population. Um, so it's estimated that it's between 13 and 17 percent of individuals engage in some form of eating disorder behavior, with about 4 percent evidencing significant elevated pathology. But those numbers are actually much higher when we look at college and university samples. Um, so this was a recent large-scale study that was done across 12 college campuses in the U.S. And they found that the rates of any binge eating or the compensatory behaviors that I just mentioned ranged between 30 and 40 percent. Um, and about one in 10 college students evidenced significantly elevated order risk. Um, and, that, oops. Um, and that's particularly concerning because we know that the college age range is also the time when we see uh, full threshold eating disorder and onset. Uh, so I mentioned that a lot of my research has focused on understanding the role of emotion in eating disorder psychology. Um, so we know that individuals with eating disorders on average have higher levels of negative affect overall. Uh, and that's reflected in part by the substantial comorbidity that we see with mood and anxiety disorders. Uh, we also see that negative affect respectively predicts increases in body dissatisfaction as well as eating disorder behaviors over time. Um, and negative affect is an implicate across various theoretical models of eating disorders as well. Um, and these are just a few. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail, um, but broadly, these affect regulation models suggest that when an individual experiences negative affect um, or emotional distress, um, they resort to eating disorder behaviors like a binge episode um, in order to escape from or regulate the negative affect, uh, which leads to a temporary reduction in that affect. Um, so as you can see, um, eating disorder behaviors like binging can become negatively reinforced and that they remove the aversive stimulus that is negative affect. Um, and one reason why we think that individuals with eating disorders resort to that kind of behavior um, is because that we see across eating disorder diagnoses, these individuals have a really hard time coping adaptively uh, with negative emotions, which we call emotion regulation difficulty. So one way that we've been able to study and tease apart functional relationships between emotion and eating disorder behaviors is through ecological momentary assessments, um, or EMA, which is something that I've utilized quite a bit in my own research, um, as well as the mentors that I've been working with recently. And basically, this is a way of uh, collecting data in natural environments in real time. Um, and this has been done through a variety of ways over the years, um, including diaries, electronic diaries, um, and more recently with smartphones. Um, and during an EMA protocol, you ask individuals to carry around one of these devices and respond to questions about their thoughts, about their feelings, and their behaviors throughout the day. And these recordings can either be signaled by uh, the participants when a target behavior occurs, like uh, an eating episode, or they can be signaled at predetermined intervals by the researcher. And typically, we use both in the research that I do. And we think that this kind of methodology has several advantages. So one, it reduces problems that we've seen with retrospective recall bias. So instead of asking someone, what were you doing two days ago? We're asking them, how are you feeling right now? We also think that this has more ecological validity. So instead of asking people to come into the lab um, and measure certain variables, um, which may be rather artificial for some things, we're assessing them as they go about their daily life. And lastly, and probably most importantly, by assessing things multiple times throughout the day, we're able to establish at the momentary level what's going on with temporal relationships, right? So if someone gets into a fight with their friend, oops, sorry, wrong button, um, and feels bad about it and resorts to an eating disorder behavior, we're able to actually map that out in terms of what's going on with their emotions. So just an ex as an example of some of those relationships that I just talked about, I'm going to just go through some findings from my dissertation that I did at Penn State University. Um, 
And this was an EMA study in which uh, we assessed 23 women with bulimia. Um, they completed a 10 day EMA protocol in which we asked them to make recordings at each eating episode, and they were signaled at five random signals throughout the day as well. Um, and so we were using these foam pilots um, with styluses. Um, so it was kind of old school, and luckily we're not using these techniques anymore. Um, but it did the job, and it's what we had at the time. Um, so at each momentary measure, we collected a rating of their affect using the positive and negative affect schedule. Um, then we also asked them the question, since the last alarm, how much attention did you pay to the following parts of your body? So we had a list of 10 different body parts, and we rated them on a scale of one to five, with five being the extreme amount of attention, and we summed those items to create an overall measure of body-focused attention at each scale. So here's what we found, and let me just orient you to this graph briefly. Um, so on the x-axis here, you'll see time, and the zero point represents the time at which a binge occurred, right? And then here on the y-axis is levels of negative affect. So as you see, with the blue line, indicates that negative affect is significantly increasing prior to the binge episode, and it decreased significantly following the binge episode. Um, so this maps on really, really nicely with this affect regulation model. Um, but it's pretty consistent also with other studies that have been done in eating disorders too, so this wasn't necessarily that surprising. So this is just an example um, from a study that was done at NRI, where I work, um, in a sample of individuals with anorexia. And they looked at the gene behaviors among those individuals and found largely the same pattern. But what was kind of interesting uh, with these data is that when we looked at that body focused attention variable, we saw that even after we controlled for negative affect, uh, the pattern of changes pretty much mirrored what we saw with negative affect, which suggests that there could be other relevant cognitive processes going on um, surrounding the binge episode. So now I'd like to just share with you a more recent project that I did with the folks at NRI and also collaborators at the University of Minnesota. Um, and our goal here was to look at different dimensions of affect in relationship to eating behaviors and cognitions among individuals with obesity. Um, so we know that binge eating does not occur invariably um, among individuals with obesity. However, it is more prevalent among the population. Um, and this is problematic not only um, from a psychological perspective, because we know that binge eating is associated with stressful impairments, but also because binge eating contributes to weight gain over time. We were also particularly interested in the construct of dietary restraints among these individuals, uh, because we know that over half of individuals with overweight or obesity are currently dieting to lose weight. Now, restraints, however, refers to the cognitive phenomenon in which one is actively attempting to restrict their intake, regardless of whether it actually translates into behavior. Um, and in eating disorders, it's often thought that dietary restraint is a bad thing, and that leads to eating disorder behaviors, and perhaps rebound weight gain. Um, but when you look at the literature, it's actually pretty inconsistent. So individuals who are high in restraint can be successful with weight maintenance without engaging in eating disorder behaviors. Um, and so one reason why we think that there might be distressed findings in that domain is the fact that there are both adaptive and maladaptive forms of restraint. Um, so rigid restraint would be um, maladaptive, so like cutting out entire food categories, like saying I'm not going to eat pizza at all. Whereas adaptive, more flexible restraint would be something like I'm going to have two pieces rather than three. And so for individuals who are overweight or obese, it's thought that more adaptive, flexible forms of restraint in the context of weight management. As I mentioned before, we know that negative affect is broadly related to binge eating, but we don't know as much about how it might relate to adherence to dietary protocols or restraints. And we can also characterize affect in multiple ways. So one is in terms of balance, so how positive or negative affect is. Another way we can think about affect is in terms of stability. So Stability refers to the extent to which affect is a trait-like, stable individual difference variable, um, or whether it's more state-like in nature and varies within a given person over time. And this distinction is important clinically because by assessing trait-like differences between people, we can identify which individuals might be most at risk to engage in certain behaviors, whereas identifying state-level or within-person relationships helps us identify the 
the moments at which an individual might be more at risk to engage in a certain behavior, like when they have an oops spike in negative affect. Um, so for this project, given that most of the research in obesity had only focused on negative affect in relationship to binge eating, we wanted to do something a little more nuanced and examine the roles of affect of valence and lability, uh, or sorry, stability, in relationship to binge eating and restraint. Um, so the first goal was to assess trait levels of negative affect and positive affect in relationship to average levels of binge eating and restraint in the population. So our hypotheses were that individuals who were on average higher in negative affect would report higher frequencies of binge eating over the entire protocol and lower average levels of restraint. Conversely, we expected that individuals who were higher in overall positive affect would report lower levels of binge frequency and higher levels of average restraint. We then looked at momentary relationships between negative affect, positive affect, binge eating, and restraint. And our thought was that at moments of elevated negative affect or momentary affect, um, individuals would be at greater likelihood to report a binge episode and lower uh, and would report lower levels of restraints in the moment. And conversely, we expected that when individuals experience relative elevations of positive affect, they would report a decreased likelihood of binging and higher levels of overall restraints. So in our sample, we had 50 adults with obesity and most of them were Caucasian women, um, and about one in five had a diagnosis of binge eating disorder. Uh, they completed baseline assessments, followed by a 14-day EMA protocol, and we used smartphones for this. Um, and during that protocol, they uh, reported eating episodes. Well, specifically, they were instructed to make recordings before and after eating. Uh, and then they were also buzzed at six times randomly throughout the day. Uh, so at baseline, they completed the back depression inventory. And then during the EMA protocol, again, they completed the positive and negative affect schedule with Canis to assess negative affect and positive affect at each recording. <coughs> Restraint was assessed by the pre-eating episode item that read, I will eat less to lose weight or avoid green events, uh, which was measured on a one to five scale with five being higher levels of restraints. And binge eating was assessed by two post-episode items that asked the person about the extent of their overeating and loss of control. Um, so if they endured superior higher on each of those items, that episode was categorized as a binge. Um, so we first assessed the trait model. So trait negative affect was actually assessed by a latent variable, which was comprised of the <coughs> depression inventory total, the aggregated EMA negative affect ratings across the whole protocol, and then a measure of affect ability, which we call the mean square successive difference or MSD. Um, basically, it's an index of how the individual varies from moment to moment to affect. We assess trait positive affect by aggregated EMA positive affect ratings. Trait level binge eating was assessed by the total number of binge episodes that were reported. Trait level restraints was assessed by the aggregated EMA restraints ratings. So this was uh, an average across all of the days. And we looked at a model using structural equation modeling or SEM. And here's what we found. So as you can see, there was this positive relationship between trait negative affect and total binge episodes. So individuals who are higher on average on those negative affect variables reported a more frequent uh, binge episodes during the protocol. And conversely, people who are higher in overall positive affect reported higher overall restraint throughout the protocol. We then looked at our within-person or state models. Um, and so in each model, our independent variables were negative and positive affect, which were taken from the pre-episode recording. And our dependent variables were restraints, measured at the pre-episode recording, um, and the likelihood of a binge episode was assessed by that post-episode uh, recording. And these were assessed by generalized estimating the equation models, or GEDs. And so the within-person effects from these models indicated the higher momentary negative affect was related to an increased likelihood of binging, as well as lower levels of congruent restraints. So this graph depicts conceptually what's going on here with these effects. So if the horizontal line is the time, oops, um, the time of the binge episode, um, no, sorry, the vertical line uh, that's blue is the time of the binge episode, and negative affect is in red uh, with the uh, dotted red line 
indicating the average level. This suggests that when individuals had a relative elevation compared to their average level of negative affect, um, they were more likely to report that eating episode as a binge, and they were less likely to report restraint. So overall, we found partial support for our hypotheses. And the findings that negative affect uh, this trait and state level was related to binge eating was largely consistent with affect regulation models. Um, and the finding that state negative affect was also related to decreased restraints could be in line with some resource depletion models, which suggests that when individuals experience negative affect, right, that interferes with their cognitive ability to focus on goals like uh, maintaining a, a diet. Um, but what was kind of the most interesting part of this was the fact that we found that trait positive affect was related to higher levels of average restraint. Um, and this could suggest that we should be thinking about promoting positive affect more in the context of weight management programs. Um, so doing things like maybe withdrawal activation or positive, positive body image intervention, or maybe promoting it indirectly through exercise and physical activity would be helpful. So given what we've learned about affect regulation and eating disorders, a lot of us have been thinking more recently about how we can expand and refine these models. And so we've been actually considering the role of cognitive processes. And one of that area, or one of those areas that I've been focused on is rumination. Um, so a group of us recently reviewed the literature on rumination in eating disorders through meta-analysis. Um, and hopefully this is the last revision that we're on. Um, but broadly, rumination is a construct that refers to perseverative, passive, self-focused thinking about the content, content, the causes, and consequences of one's ethic state without taking any problem-solving action. So basically it's thoughts like, why am I feeling this badly? Um, why couldn't I do better? I wish things had gone differently, right? So there's no real problem solving about it. It's just dwelling on bad things that happened. Uh, and this was a construct that was really pioneered and developed uh, in the field of depression by the late Susan Millman, so that those of you who might be familiar. And what theories of rumination suggest is that it's not only the content of our thoughts that matter, it's the way in which we're having them um, that create a particularly potent environment uh, for the development of negative affect and psychopathology. Um, so for example, EMA studies outside of the field of eating disorders have demonstrated that negative affect and rumination have a reciprocal and aggravating relationship with each other over time. So if I ruminate about how bad I feel, I'm likely to feel worse, which in turn increases my level of rumination and the cycle continues, right? Until our negative affect really gets elevated. And while individuals often think that by ruminating about certain things that might lead to a solution, we see that it actually decreases our problem solving abilities and kind of paralyzes us because we get stuck in our thoughts. And so for those reasons, it's been conceptualized as this transdiagnostic form of maladaptive emotion regulation. And so while in our review, we certainly found that individuals with eating disorder ruminate uh, more than those without or eating disorders, we found out that Theories and models of eating disorders have really not considered the role of cognitive processes um, like rumination. And we think that it might have relevance for understanding elevations and negative affect at the momentary level, perhaps. Another related area that I've been increasingly interested in is neurocognitive functioning and eating disorders. And this is another review that we recently did in the area of eating disorders with some colleagues. And so broadly, neurocognitive functioning, and specifically executive functioning, uh, refers to a range of different top-down cognitive control processes that act in coordination to adapt our information processing and behaviors according to our goal uh, from moment to moment. So this includes things like inhibition, um, so the ability to filter out distracting information or inhibit an inappropriate motor response, right? Um, working memory, so our ability to hold with and work with information Lines, as well as flexibility, which is also called set shifting, um, which refers to our ability to adaptively shift our attention from moment to moment according to different circumstances. And so we know that executive functioning is really important for self regulation, including emotion regulation from research outside of eating disorders. Um, and we see deficits in various uh, areas across different psychiatric disorders, too, including eating disorders, which we found in our review. But like our conclusions with rumination, uh, something that we found was that we haven't really considered how these processes may influence emotion regulation. 
in eating disorders. So in terms of future directions, um, my goal, or at least one of my goals, is to try to elucidate cognitive processes that are underlying emotions with regulation in eating disorders. Um, and to address a couple of the things that I mentioned before, um, I'm currently conducting a study at NRI, where I am, in which we're recruiting women with binge eating behavior from a local eating disorder clinic, as well as North Dakota State University. And our first aim is to assess momentary relationships between negative affect, dimensions of protective functioning, specifically brain control and attention bias, uh, and binge eating. And we're examining whether uh, executive functioning uh, or aspects of it may mediate or explain the relationship that we see between negative affect and binge eating. Another aim that we have is to examine rumination as a possible mediator of that relationship and whether that helps us understand uh, the relationship between negative affect and binge eating at the momentary level. So that's a work in progress, and I'm hoping maybe by the end of the year I'll, I'll have that done and results ready to report. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit, um, still focus on EMA, but talk about the other area of interest that I have, which is assessments and classification of eating psychology. And I realized that this is kind of included in a bunch of different stuff. Um, one broad area is examining psychometric properties of eating disorder assessments that use the field, like how they function in males, um, the ecological validity of different measures, um, as well as the DSM severity test squares. I've also been interested in what we call diagnostic left um, So a lot of people who have significant eating psychopathology don't meet full criteria for a diagnosis of anorexia, bulimia, or the eating disorder. And one of those syndromes that's emerged in the literature is called purging disorder. So these individuals engage in recurring purging behavior, but unlike bulimia, they do not have an objectively large binge episode. Um, so I've done some work trying to understand what might be going on uh, with these individuals too. And lastly, I've been interested in empirical classification of eating disorders. Um, and so I'll just go through a study um, that I recently did in which I had an opportunity to mentor an undergraduate student, uh, Bethany, who was working with us at the time and was interested in going to grad school and she had interest in eating disorders. Um, so we did a project in which our goal was to see if we could subtype individuals with bulimia based on different affect variables <laughs> and use EMA to do that. So just as background, we know that there's a lot of heterogeneity or variability um, in symptom presentations within and across eating disorder diagnostic categories. Um, so for instance, <coughs> eating disorder uh, with varying personality types, uh, neurobiological factors, levels of restraint, as well as affect. Uh, and with respect to affective functioning, one way in which we can think about it is intensity, right? So individuals can be relatively higher or lower in negative affect. Um, but another way that we can think about uh, affect is respect to uh, mobility. Um, so there has been some work in bulimia um, to suggest that individuals who are higher in overall negative affect have more severe symptoms, but we haven't really considered the role of mobility. Right, or how much that affect varies throughout the day. Um, and so, for instance, the individuals with the red and the blue profiles would be characterized by relatively higher affect mobility compared to the other two profiles, but they would still differ in affect intensity, right? So overall levels um, of the yellow and red profiles are higher than the overall levels in the blue and green profile, right? So there's quite a bit of variation that we could potentially see. Um, oops. That. Okay, so again, our goal is to assess um, whether affect can help us subtype bulimia, and we're specifically interested in whether affect mobility may contribute to subtype bulimia uh, because this has been shown to be related to higher levels of eating severity as well as greater uh, levels of impulsivity. And our hypothesis was that individuals with higher negative affect intensity and mobility would evidence the greatest severity of symptoms. So intensity and mobility would have somewhat of an added effect to symptoms, right? So to do so, we use an approach called latent profile analysis, or LPA, which is an empirical approach uh, in classification. And basically, it's a way of identifying uh, naturally occurring groups in a given sample or population based on certain uh, variables or characteristics, which we call individual variables. 
Um, in that case, our variables were affixed. Um, but it's one thing just to cluster people together based on certain characteristics. The most important part uh, is whether those clusters differ meaningfully on other variables that were not used to define the groups, right? And we call those external validators. Um, so profile or late profile analysis involves both profile identification, as we cluster people together, as well as validating those profiles and see how they differ um, in meaningful variables. So for this study, we included 130 women with bleeding and nervosa. Again, mostly Caucasian. They completed baseline interviews and questionnaires, followed by a two-week DNA protocol, uh, during which they were signaled at six times throughout the day. Uh, and at each signal, they completed like affect again for the panic, as well as any episodes of binge and purging that they had. Um, so to so identify the profile, um, we use the following indicator variables. So negative affect and positive affect intensity were calculated as the mean EMA negative affect ratings, the mean EMA positive affect ratings, and we also included the back depression score inventory total score as another measure of intensity. And then to assess negative and positive affect mobility, we used that MSSD statistic for both negative and positive affect. Um, so we compared one to eight class solutions uh, in analyses. And they were evaluated based on the DIC and the AIC bit indices with lower numbers indicating the better data. Um, so we identified a four profile solution based on those characteristics. Um, so I'll just go through each profile here and describe them. So the first profile um, we labeled as stable normal. So these individuals had lower overall negative affect but higher positive <coughs> affect intensity, right? So negative affect uh, intensity, positive affect intensity lower levels of mobility, and lower overall levels of uh, intensity with the DI2. The next group that we identified, we labeled as stable depressed. So these individuals had relatively higher negative affect intensity, evidenced by the EMA, negative affect variable, and the DI score, um, relatively lower levels of positive affect intensity, um, but still relatively lower mobility. The third group we labeled as unstable normal, um, so this group had relatively lower levels of negative affect intensity, higher levels of positive affect intensity, um, but relatively elevated uh, mobility. And the last group, which was the group that we were particularly interested in, uh, we labeled as unstable depressed. So these individuals had relatively elevated negative affect intensity, uh, as well as higher affect mobility by those uh, MSSD scores. We then uh, looked at profile validation with the following variables. And so the profiles were compared to each other uh, using ANOVAs on uh, following indices. So we assessed eating disorder symptom severity using PPE, uh, co occurring diagnoses, uh, history of childhood trauma, as well as borderline personality traits. Um, and here's what we found. So there were significant differences in eating disorder severity, childhood trauma history, and borderline traits. Um, but we didn't find significant differences in comorbidities or uh, binge or purge frequency. So the overall take home really though, is that the blue group, so the uh, unstable to press, so the people who are high in negative affect and high um, in mobility, did not differ significantly from those who we labeled as stable to press, so high negative affect intensity, uh, but lower levels of mobility, uh, which is what we kind of expected them to find. So while we did identify distinct bulimic profiles based on effective functioning, we, uh, at least based on this data, found limited evidence for the additive relevance of affect mobility when subtyping individuals who were in um, Nevertheless, this is pretty consistent with previous studies of bulimia that have found that the presence of higher levels of depression or negative affect uh, indicates a more severe bulimic profile. Um, but there are also a couple limitations to note. So, if you might have noticed, the sample size for the unstable depressed group was relatively small. So, that could have precluded our ability to detect differences with other validators. And we also may not have assessed all of the relevant, relevant validators, like emotion regulation domains or facts of uh, impulsivity. So, now I'd like to talk a little bit about future direction that I'm kind of excited about. 
Um, and that is network analysis. And some have said that this is an emerging approach that will really transform the way in which we conceptualize like pathology with like death disorders. And historically, research in psychopathology has resembled a disease model in that a latent causal variable gives rise to observable symptoms. Uh, so much like a lung tumor causes the symptoms of shortness of breath, chest pain, coughing up blood, and fatigue. We think that psychiatric symptom or disorders like depression give rise to things like sadness, hopelessness, insomnia, and fatigue, for example. Conversely, network theory suggests that disorders are systems of causally connected, interacting symptoms rather than latent entities, right? So the symptoms are the active ingredients rather than the effects of some latent cause. Uh, and symptoms that hang together we label as psychiatric disorders. So as an example, if you imagine an individual um, whose spouse leaves, leaves her, she starts ruminating about it, which leads her to have difficulty sleeping at night. In turn, she has difficulty concentrating at work and becomes really irritable. Um, she feels more negative about herself, um, pessimistic about the future, and loses interest in a lot of the things that she used to enjoy, especially those activities with her husband, which in turn just increases her rumination about all of these things. And so once enough of these symptoms are present uh, and impairing, we would label that as depression, right? So it's really a network of symptoms rather than some underlying cause. Oops, that's right. Um, and in the network, we call the symptoms or the circles here nodes and the connections between the symptoms edges. So really when you compare a latent variable approach and a network approach, you can see that they differ fundamentally in the reasons for which we think symptoms seem to hang together or cluster together in psychiatric disorders. And here's just an example of that. So this was a large-scale study that was done that examined symptoms of 12 different diagnostic categories. And you can see here that symptoms of different disorders, right, seem to cluster together. But there's a lot of connections between these clusters, which we think would help us understand comorbidity. And according to network theory, greater connectivity in a network is also thought to convey greater severity or vulnerability to psychopathology. Um, so in a loosely connected sparse network like this one, uh, you can think of it as like a domino effect. If you activate one symptom, right, if it's not close to others, it's not likely to lead to widespread activation in the system or in the system. Conversely, if you have a pretty densely connected network like this, with a lot of connections and symptoms closer together, it's like knocking down a domino close to a lot of others, and it will set off a chain reaction, uh, or at least will be more likely to. We also think that this could have treatment implications, um, because just as you can topple a house of cards by removing or targeting um, one card in the structure, if we target the key maintaining mechanisms in the network, we might be able to disrupt the structure or loosen those connections, so individuals would it be predisposed to have widespread symptom activation um, or would it decrease the severity? And this has really exploded only within the last two years or so in psychopathology, even though network analysis has been around for many, many years in other fields like um, social systems and educational studies um, and even traffic control. But to date, there's only been three studies that have been done. Oops in eating disorders, uh, and they've all been cross-sectional so far. Um, so a group of us recently got together, and we wrote about how we think we can apply network analysis in the field of eating disorders and psychology. Um, and we also looked at a treatment seeking sample and compared the network structures of those um, individuals who had denser networks at admission uh, compared to those who had looser networks at, at admission. Um, and we assess how some of them you know, change the network structure over time. Um, so those are just a couple of things um, that I've been working on in this area and that I'm excited about in the future. So an overall summary of, summary of my work um, suggests that world and motion related processes are certainly important in understanding the formative function of new disorders like psychology. Um, and growing research also implicates the role of cognitive processes. Um, such as executive functioning and rumination that could have an impact on emotion regulation too. Um, as I just mentioned, network approaches seem to show potential too in further understanding the structure of symptoms. So in terms of future directions, 
Um, I'm particularly excited about continuing to examine the role of cognitive processes and regulation at the momentary level. Um, so I'm integrating measures of emotion and neurocognition with PMA currently. Um, and another direction, like I mentioned, is examining temporal relationships within network structures of eating disorder symptoms. And uh, we're thinking about using EMA for this too. So hopefully EMA will be a part of my future regardless of what I do. Um, and it will help us further understand um, both the form and the structure of eating psychology. Uh, before I end and take questions, I'd just like to thank all the mentors I've had in the shape of training, as well as my many collaborators that I had a hard time. Pleasure to work with. Well, thank you very much. Any questions? How are you planning on using or kind of thought about how you're going to measure cognitive function or executive function? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we're actually collaborating with a colleague at the University of Central Florida who has done EMA and he has adapted specific tasks for delivery via smartphone um, or smart devices. So like things like go no go tasks and dot pro tasks. Um, he's taken them and designed um, EMA version so people can just log on and do the task. And he's just one of many people who are starting to do this in the field too. Um, and so it's still an emerging approach and we have a lot to learn, but um, we're definitely moving towards trying to do that to assess variability. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, also, um, with respect to some the cognitive term that you were sort of using in your recent work with yes. cognitive version, I'm wondering about you were suggesting that um, a working memory, uh, executive function, sure. yeah. um, might be due to the relationship. I was going to ask you about a little bit about more about network analysis. Um, I guess in general, um, with network analysis, I'm, I'm, I'm guess I'm seeing the parallel with some of the transdiagnostic, yeah. and just wondering how you presented this morning. Maybe people didn't see that about uh, a transdiagnostic protocol. Uh, just seeing how you see potential research in that area. Uh, in, in terms of transdiagnostic uh, approaches to treatment? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, it's really uh, an approach that's emerging still. Um, we're learning a lot more about even how to do the analysis still. Um, but what we think we could do, right, is have an individualized network for a given person, right? And we can model not only eating disorder symptoms, um, but the other uh, relevant variables that may have transdiagnostic uh, consequences like emotion regulation. <laughs> so um, we're able to see connections not only with eating disorder symptoms but also comorbid symptoms like 
uh, perhaps not in the of injury, right? Because that has a very similar uh, function uh, with human disorder behavior. And so we're able to look at multiple relationships um, uh, in a given group of symptoms at the same time. Um, so it can help us understand transdiagnostic uh, concepts uh, like emotional regulation and other decisions. I don't know if that kind of answers. So both at an individual level as yeah. well as at a more class level? Oh. Right, yeah, it has applications for both. Yeah, I think in terms of direct clinical applications, uh, the idea is that eventually we would take a network, right, and be able to map out how symptoms are relating to each other for a given person. And then, similar to like a case formulation, we'd be able to identify the key target of an intervention. Uh, but we can also do it at the group level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, does network analysis also work with the mechanisms, or is it more symptom based? Um, so the idea, right, is that you would just focus on symptom relationships. So uh, while you could focus on a specific symptom, um, given that it has connections in the network, right, by deactivating just one symptom, mm -hmm. um, it's likely to be turned back on by all the other connections. So we really have to identify chains of symptoms uh, in terms of thinking about intervention, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Okay. Um, but again, a lot of this work is still kind of emerging, and so... So it yeah. it makes sense in terms of the help support this trans diagnostic model. I guess I'm trying to I'm still grappling with how it might change the classification system that we've found these kind of overlap. Yeah, no, I think the basic implication that it would shift us away from the categorical approach, largely, um, like we have in the DSM, um, by looking at whole structures of symptoms rather than just in people in categories based on the presence or absence of symptoms. Um, and I think that's really the way people are thinking about it transforming the way in which we think about like pathology. Like, um, I think that's interesting. I've heard in a math clinician, and I think the psychologist saw math in the system in the network theory, but I seem to have a lot of problems in system theory in general. And so I think it's very interesting mm -hmm. that um, you're, you're sort of talking about a disorder as like an emergent property. It emerges from a certain organization of right. symptoms, right? You change that organization and <laughs> Uh, so, you know, as you mentioned, we're getting away from cause effect. Mm -hmm. and right. And so, even, um, even mechanisms, which assume cause and effect. So, uh, it's interesting. Uh, and it's, it's, it seems like you, um, are people talking about, you know, these are the kinds of mathematical models and, and uh, to try to capture these kinds of relationships and things. Know, reorganization among symptoms. Yeah, yeah, people are definitely trying to figure out the best analytical approaches still. Um, so, as I mentioned, a lot of the research still is at the cross sectional level, right? Whereas theoretical implication is longitudinal with how these symptoms relate to each other. And so, we're figuring out how we can model temporal relationships. And the methods exist, right? But people just haven't been able um, to really capitalize on them yet. Um, so our group is particularly interested in actually, we're working on a couple projects right now where we're taking EMA data, right? And we're looking at moment-to-moment -moment network. Uh, <laughs> so that's really where I think the most useful come because to look at a cross-sectional structure is fine and good, um, but it's really most useful when you can identify potentially causal relationships, not that we're moving the variable, but um, it can at least give us a better view. Yeah. Um, I'm not too familiar with literature. But in regards of uh, negative effect and self esteem, um, I know they might be closely associated to one another. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if in your study you guys kind of assess uh, the, the level of self esteem that someone might have. Sure. Yeah, effect. yeah, definitely. That's something that we see a lot in eating disorders low self esteem. Um, and it's actually um, part of treatment protocols too for eating disorders. So, like the trans diagnostic model that I presented. Uh, earlier today, I didn't do it with its specific patients, but for individuals who really do have uh, pervasive low self-esteem, uh, there is a module to, to deal with that in that treatment, for example. Um, 
in terms of conceptualization of how that relates to some of these things, um, our group has also looked at something called self-discrepancy, um, which is a term, I guess, really it was bigger back in the 90s, but it's basically the concept that when um, individuals have, who have standards uh, for themselves that they're not meeting, right, that creates a discrepancy between their ideals and where they feel they actually are, right? And we've done some research in our group um, assessing how that relates to negative affect and eating disorder behaviors. And um, there's actually been a treatment protocol developed around that relationship, which is called integrative uh, cognitive affective therapy, or ICATS. Um, and basically what they found is that when individuals have higher levels of discrepancies, right, they feel more uh, negative about themselves, not surprisingly, um, which in turn promotes eating disorder behaviors. And so definitely self-concept has been something that uh, we've thought about a lot with our research, um, as well as other people in the So, great point. Well, thank you. Thank you.